Hello everyone and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. My name is Stephanie Mock and I will be guest hosting this week's episode for Matt and Justine. Today we have a very special guest with us, Jason Brand, the co-owner of Manulele Distillers, who make Kohana Hawaiian Agricole Rum. So the feature of our series here is to meet about locals who are furthering our Hawaii agriculture, making new products, and really bringing these two worlds together for the community and also for research into agriculture and diversifying Hawaii's agricultural scene. So like I mentioned, we have Jason Brand of Manulele Distillers, our local rum makers who make local uh, Kohana rum. So let's take a quick opportunity and meet Jason. Jason, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Yeah, so our show usually, we bring someone on, we interview them, and we learn a little bit about their background, how they got involved in agriculture, or how they came to Hawaii, or both. And then we'll talk a little bit more about why you're here specifically today. Okay? So Fabulous. My first question, how did you get involved in agriculture? Sure, good question. My background originally was in finance. And during that time, or while I was in finance, I was living in Tokyo. Japan and my wife was working in New York and Hawaii was always our meeting place okay. and so finally we decided <laughs> to move to Hawaii uh, just so we can see each other and then when we got to Hawaii we were like well how do we become part of this wonderful community and we thought one of the better ways to do it was through agriculture and so we started to look at either Hawaii food independence uh, which we built a very large sustainable farm and then Hawaii energy independence and it was in the pursuit of energy independence, which I did with one of my business partners, um, that we stumbled upon these Hawaiian cane varieties. And the cane varieties, which we were originally looking for biodiesel, um, proved to have wonderful Hawaiian stories, legends, and cultural purposes. And that led us right into the world of, I guess, sugar cane growing and then ultimately rum making. And so you tried, so originally you were looking at sugar cane as a biodiesel and it realized that maybe it wasn't the best option, but that obviously this heritage crop here in Hawaii, which we could spend, we could spend thousands of shows talking about just the history of sugar cane here in Hawaii and how it made it what it is today. But you were looking at it as a biodiesel, hmm, maybe, maybe not the best. And so you were like, what other uses can we do? And that kind of naturally led you to rum? Well, let me tell you a little bit about these canes, because they're very different than what people find on, uh, let's say, Kauai or Maui in terms of the sugar industry. Okay. The Hawaiians had sugar cane roughly at the time of the first voyagers reaching the island, meaning they brought the first sugar canes with them. So we're talking almost a thousand years ago. And to give us context in, in that time period, when people, at least in the United States, think about sugarcane, they're usually thinking about Florida, Louisiana, Louisiana or the, or the yeah. Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Christopher Columbus brought sugarcane to the Caribbean on his third voyage. So you're talking about the year 1500. So you're talking about 500 years ago versus Hawaii having it 1,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the history of sugarcane here is a lot longer. It's just when we think of sugarcane today, and it had a wonderful depending on your viewpoint, impact on the island's economy and shaping the culture. You're talking more about the plantation days. Mm -hmm. These sugar canes come way before the plantations, okay. right? Um, what, what happened during the 1800s, 1900s, when the plantations moved in, they had the goal of making table sugar. And so the Hawaiian canes, and we'll get into them, are very fat. Uh, they're very juicy, and they grow not necessarily straight up, but kind of lean over everything that a sugar plantation does not want. <laughs> they want thin cane so it's easy to go through the mill, medium juice content because they're trying to evaporate the juice out to get the crystals, um, and they want it to grow straight so it's easy to harvest. So mm -hmm. everything that they don't want. So by, I guess by 1900, most of these Hawaiian canes were just gone, and all the Louisiana and Florida and mainland canes is what you find now in the big plantations. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the islands, which also are no longer. Uh, so we find ourselves in a funny position of, after the last sugar plantation closed, one of the largest sugar growers on the island. But we're back to the original Hawaiian sugar canes. The heirloom varieties, the heirloom varieties you're varieties. talking about, as opposed to the commercial production monocropping that we saw in the plant exactly. plantations. Exactly. And so if you just look real quick um, at some of these, you know, this is a purple can. Most people are thinking of, and this is called Mahaula, most people are thinking about sugarcane as a green yellow cane that they're familiar with from the mainland or even from Maui or Kauai. Mm -hmm. It's what they're familiar with. You know, it would be more akin to this color, 
um, although this is a lot fatter than uh, what they're looking at. But you can see we showed you purple, that's yellow. This is actually Manulele sugarcane. Mm, um, namesake. The namesake company. This was the first sugarcane we found, um, and it came from a botanical garden. So we found 22 of the 34 heirloom varieties that we grow, and they've all been genetically tested. Uh, we, we work with one of the lead ethnobotanists at University of Hawaii. Uh, we work a lot with some of the lead scientists from HARC, the Hawaiian Agricultural Research Center, which are the former sugar scientists from the plantation days. And those two bodies or universities have really helped us identify and, and uh, expand our collection. Uh, we found about 22 varieties of the 34 growing in botanical gardens and found the rest through nature walks. Mm -hmm. So it was really just walking, wandering through fields. Sugarcane is a grass, mm -hmm. so it will grow. You know, it's very forgiving. <laughs> it's a very forgiving plant. It'll grow, and uh, we would just have to look for these canes and then eventually identify them. But, you know, we saw purple, we saw yellowish green. This is purple and yellow with mm -hmm. stripes. Here you have one that's, uh, I guess, purple with yellow. It's a little bit more green. Um, and here is interesting. You can see how these nodes are much tighter than mm -hmm. here. And this says that this cane experienced a bit of a water shortage, mm -hmm. right? So it was stressed in this stressed phase of its out. life. Mm -hmm. Another neat thing, if you don't mind me keep talking. No, but, please do. That's uh, why we brought you on today. <laughs> another neat thing about the sugar cane, for those who don't know sugar cane, you can see right here the keiki, or the little baby plant, is coming out of the node. So it's coming out right out of the knuckle. So when this sugar cane wants to reproduce, it's going to lay down. These stalks are 14 feet tall. So they will lay down. And then when it hits the ground, the keiki is going to kind of grow. So it self-spaces, mm, okay. right? And then it'll keep laying down and keep growing. Um, eventually, one of these nodes will actually send out a chemical and kill the other one. So it doesn't overcrowd <laughs> Survival itself. of the fittest yeah. node. <laughs> um, this is a cane. This is uh, one of the more powerful canes uh, that we found. This is called Laucona. You can see it's white and green. The leaves of this plant have a white stripe in it. And its Hawaiian name means to bend or to break. And it is used, and this is a neat story, Manulele means flying bird in Hawaiian. And there was actually uh, tales of a, a love story, uh, a love ceremony or a uh, love spell that a kahuna, a priest, could enchant Manulele sugarcane, fly away to cat, fly away and bring in the love of another. And there were three Hawaiian canes that could bring in love or create kind of bonds of connection. And the antidote was Laocona, okay. or death. Okay. <laughs> um, the strongest antidote. The, the strongest <laughs> antidote, or at least the one if you had to choose one. But those are neat legends and stories that we found as we were researching these canes, originally for energy. But when you started to see, one, how old they are, and two, for Hawaiians, Sugarcane juice was used in all their tribal tattoos, uh, right? It was ash in the juice of a sugarcane. Sugarcane was used in almost every Hawaiian medicine. Sugarcane leaves were used in wallpapers of the houses. Uh, there was a time where uh, Kamehameha mandated that sugarcane is grown outside of almost every Hawaiian house so that if the military came through, there was basically Gatorade or pick-me-up without yeah, to drink. Uh, Sugarcane was a superfood in the sense of if there was a drought, uh, it was one of the last plants to die. Mm -hmm. And so it stored uh, the most juice content. So it was a life-saving plant in that respect. And so sugarcane, like many other Hawaiian plants, really became a big, big part of the, the society, the culture, and the way, I guess, this world was shaped. Um, but again, it wasn't until recently, and it took us six years to find all these canes again, genetically test them and kind of build, I'm not sure if it's the largest collection of Hawaiian sugar canes in the world, but I would guess that we now have <laughs> the largest collection of Hawaiian sugar canes in the world uh, growing in Kunia right now. And so do you, on your farm then in central Oahu, do you grow all 34 varieties or varietals? Yeah, so we grow all 34 varietals. Um, we plant out some more than others, uh, and when we get to the rum section, we'll explain why, but it has to do with when we make rum, 
We only make rum out of one of the 34 varietals at a time. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is very different than most people in the world of sugar cane who just take sugar cane and turn it into rum, or they take molasses and turn it into rum. So in the tasting room, and now we're off of farming, but <laughs> you can sit down and actually try three different bottles, which is three different sugar canes, and taste the way just the sugar cane changed the rum and taste the differences in sugar cane. Um, and I'll come back to that in the next segment. <laughs> so you were talking about your farms in central Oahu, in Kunia specifically. Yeah. How many acres do you have? So in Kunia right now we have 21 acres, soon to be 27 acres planted. Um, and we are trying to get to about 100 acres. Um, I won't say by the end of this year, although if magic happens, it'll be by the end of this year. But certainly, let's be, let's, let's yeah. be optimistic. 100 <laughs> acres but, by the end of the but year. But certainly <laughs> by the end of 2018, okay. we should have 100 acres planted. Oh, that's fantastic. And so with that 100 acres, may I ask how much rum that produces? Is that is that a question I can even you, ask? You can ask that, and it varies by field. Okay. Um, right now we target, and this is on the light side, we don't do... Again, we're not a plantation, so we are not trying to over-fertilize things and maximize yield per acre. We're trying to be very gentle to the land mm -hmm. and harken back and respect the cane and the power that this cane brings. Um, so we are targeting around 30 tons per acre mm -hmm. in our production. Uh, we found that, and I think the record in Cunea is north of 100 tons an acre. <laughs> um, and so you have the potential if you really kind of treat cane uh, to get a lot. But right now we're getting about 30 tons per acre. Um, and that'll boil down, uh, depending on our juice extraction uh, and how we make it, to lots of bottles of rum. Uh, right now, in terms of case, you know, this year we'll have about 3,000 cases made, only because most everything is going into the barrel house. Okay. And so that'll be next year's so rum. And so mm -hmm. every year you're going to get much more, more and more Hawaiian agricole rum uh, produced out of these fields. Um, and the goal of going to 100 acres is really to begin to uh, show what I'll say, you know, this one of the world's class rum. This is one of the finest agricole rums, certainly, that I've ever tasted. So I'll say it's one of the <laughs> finest agricole rums in the world uh, to not just Hawaii, but to the mainland and then internationally as well. Yeah, I think you've given us a great background of, like I said, we could spend a thousand shows talking mm -hmm. about the history of sugarcane, but you've given us a really good, brief understanding of, you know, these heirloom vari um, varietals, as you call them. Uh, that you found 22 in botanical gardens and you found the rest just walking throughout the island finding those wild varieties again and creating if you will a seed bank or a grass bank um, of the 34 varietals and keeping that knowledge going by you know commercially producing all 34 varietals so that it can continue and the line can continue so thank you so much we're going to take a quick break and then we'll we'll learn more about rum production itself so we're taking the grass to glass approach we focus on the grass and now we're going to focus on the glass part on yeah. our second half so wonderful so we'd like to thank jason brand for giving us a quick understanding of sugarcane production on their farm at manulele distillers in central oahu kunia specifically and when we come back after our short break, we'll talk about value-added production, agritourism, retail operations of Kohana rum at Manulele Distillers. Thank you. We'll see you soon.
Welcome back, everyone. We encourage those who are streaming this live to tweet us questions at ThinkTechHI. We'd love to hear from you. Right now, we have Jason Brand, co-owner of Manulele Distillers, who make Kohana Hawaiian Agricole Rum. He just gave us a quick, brief understanding of uh, the sugarcane production they have on their farm in Kunia, which is in central Oahu. So he was talking about there's 34 varietals and how they commercially produce all of them. So we thought we'd take the grass to glass approach, and so we focus our first half of the show on grass, the sugar cane itself. And now we're going to focus on the glass, so how it becomes the high-end quality product known as Kohana Rum. So, Jason, I'd like to thank you again for being in the studio with us. Thank you for having me. And so we talked about the 34 varietals, and I thought after it's harvested, can you kind of take us through a, a quick uh, timeline of how it's made into your your famous Kohana room. Sure, would love to. Uh, normally, and at our distillery, we still do everything by hand. So we actually will hand harvest um, several times a week four tons of sugar cane. Oh and so we will bring that sugar cane, and our field is pretty much next to the distillery. Um, we will bring four tons of sugar cane to the distillery and then crush it or juice it right there. And out of that, we'll get roughly 500 gallons of juice. So this is fresh squeezed sugarcane juice. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> you almost just want to pour rum yeah. into it right there, and you have a, yeah. a tea punch. But uh, we take that sugarcane juice and, and mix it, or basically introduce a yeast into it. And the yeast is going to consume all the sugar that's in the sugarcane juice. So the yeast is going to eat the sugar and convert it into carbon dioxide, which will be released into the air and alcohol. And somewhere between three days and a week, it will be done with its mm -hmm. consumption process. Okay. And then the yeast will begin to die off. But what we're left with is basically a sweet sugarcane wine. That'll be roughly between six and 10% alcohol. Um, so you could actually drink it as a wine and it tastes quite good. Yeah. Um, but I like it better as you a like rum. You like the rum. <laughs> so then we'll have 500 gallons of this nice wine sugarcane wine that we'll put into our still and begin to boil that wine to evaporate it. And alcohol has a lower boiling point than water. So the alcohol is going to rise first. Mm -hmm. And so we will go ahead and I guess allow it to move through the process going through our uh, still and begin to interact with copper. Mm -hmm. And copper is going to begin to pull off or at least uh, uh, chemically remove things like fusel oils mm -hmm. and, and uh, begin to interact with the, the alcohol vapors. And that's going to then leave our pot still and move into our column still. Uh, and there we're going to go ahead and remove more and more impurities uh, that are, exist through the distillation process or existed in the original cane juice. Stuff that we don't want to drink, things like acetone or mm. methanol, um, flavors that you don't necessarily you want. You don't like drinking those? No, <laughs> that's, that's made for nail polish <laughs> removing and to run our tractors. Yeah. Um, so we'll remove things that are off-putting flavors and allow flavors that you like, things like butterscotch, uh, vanillas, banana blossom. Uh, I find in my tasting red hot candy, baked cinnamon, mm. rock candy, all tends to come through the distillation process naturally through what existed as a flavonoid in the sugarcane juice itself in the interaction with the yeast. And so once we have these, I guess, flavors, uh, we will take the flavors we don't want and move them to the side, keep the flavors we want, that's called the heart of the run, and then continue to distill flavors that we don't think can make it, but maybe we can recycle or reprocess in a different way, but never consume it. Um, and so we take those hearts and then we begin to age. Um, and for a white rum, we will age no less than 90 days. Okay. And for an aged rum, it could be you know, years, mm -hmm. depending on when the barrel and when Mother Nature says it's ready. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty of that as a craft distiller is it's ready when it says it's delicious and ready. So we always say we're in pursuit of deliciousness. Okay. <laughs> I love that. So you're talking about the, the clear one we see here on our screen is no less than 90 days. And then the, the different colors, are those just different um, varietals, or is it also the aging process, or a little bit of both? 
Sure. So what I brought for you here is just a little sampling of what we, we do. Um, Don't worry, we're not going to be drinking on <laughs> <laughs> For those who have to watch this, you should come to the tasting room and Absolutely. you can do this live. Um, this is our white rum. This is what we call kea. The kea is the Hawaiian word for white. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is our white agricole rum. For those that don't know, an agricole rum versus a, a regular rum, or the rum you generally would find uh, in the well of a bar, um, is different because regular, most rums, 99% of the world's rum is made with molasses. Mm -hmm. So it's made with the byproduct of making table sugar. And somebody long ago figured out, hey, there's still sweetness in here. I can go ahead and ferment it and make rum. The problem is you're using a byproduct, and so most rum you're getting and there are some very good regular molasses-based rums, but most rums you, you blend with uh, juice or rum and coke because you're actually trying to hide the flavor of a mm -hmm. rum. With an agricole rum, you're starting with a very high quality product like fresh squeezed sugarcane juice. Okay. And you end up having a rum that becomes a sipping rum. Very floral in its uh, bouquet, so it, ta it smells almost like a sugarcane field. Oh my goodness. Um, but there's no sugar in it because the yeast have consumed, consumed all the sugar. Consumed it all. Um, and so for those that are on Atkins diets or low sugar diets, it's, <laughs> That's it's, good. it's, a, it, it's <laughs> advocating it's, yes. for dieters. Great <laughs> for dieters much, out there. Much diets. better than beer and wine, <laughs> uh, which have You're plenty, of, calorie, plenty no of sugar. sugar. <laughs> um, so that's what the, the white rum would be. It's basically a sipping rum. Um, and rum is going through the same renaissance that I think you saw in vodkas or in tequilas or in whiskeys and gins, um, where it used to be you would do a shot of tequila and you keep looking, where's my lime and salt? <laughs> right. And then through a better use of agave or a better distillation process, you now have sipping tequilas again in the world. And the same thing occurred in vodkas. And so rum is going through that renaissance. And agricole rum, I think, is at the heart of leading that uh, rum renaissance. As we get to the brown rums, um, what we call our aged rums, this is the same white rum, but it's now sat in a wooden barrel. Mm -hmm. And at the distillery, we use a variety of barrels. What we try to do is find a wood that's going to express, at least as our distillery thinks about it, the essence of the sugar cane that we're, we're actually using to make that rum. Remember, we use 34 different varieties. Right. And each one has a Hawaiian legend or history to it. And so we're trying to identify what we feel when we hear that story and taste the sugar cane as fresh juice, taste it again as a white spirit. How can we express it as an aged spirit and still maintain, in our own opinion, the truth about that sugar cane? And it's a fun process. It's a very sensory oriented process because you're always tasting and saying, I get that feeling. You're I just get that. tasting all day. Yeah, well, you want to get the mana of that sugar cane, <laughs> right. that power, at least as you interpret it. Um, and so it'll sit in a barrel, and our barrels will range from new American oak to used American oak to French oak uh, to barrels that might have been used to make port or sherry or cognac. Um, we just finished a rum, and it all sold out very quickly. <laughs> that was used in uh, a Scotch distillery from Scotland. Uh, and it added a big peaty, smoky flavor to the rum, which was mm. quite interesting. Um, so for those people out there that like whiskey and bourbons, it's, it's leaning that way, although I find an aged rum much more flavorful than an aged scotch or whiskey. That's, again, my opinion. But uh, I have to agree with you. I, <laughs> I went to the farm a couple of days ago, and I did a tasting, and I really like the brown <laughs> rums better, personally. The aged um, rum. But they're all good. They're all good, obviously. So we've, obviously, I don't want to taunt our audience by, oh, look at these wonderful <laughs> rums that we, you can't drink through the TV. So can you talk a little bit about how people can find Kohana rum or can they come to your farm? Sure. So we now, uh, and it took us a long time to get here, we now are open seven days a week from 10, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., located in Cunia. And we are at the old Del Monte Plantation. In fact, we took over the Del Monte General Store in Cunia mm. Camp. So it's a very old building, a 60-year-old building uh, that was once the U.S. Post Office, the barber shop for the community, a supermarket for the community, a feed store. It had a restaurant all when we had plantations on Oahu. Mm -hmm. and Del Monte left the island a little over a decade ago. So we refurbished this into what I'll call modern agricultural architecture. Um, but if you go to kohanarum.com, you can go ahead and book a tour right on the website, uh, and then you can come see the distillery for yourself. 
Nice. So you can actually take a tour in the historical building you were talking about and kind of see taking the heirloom or the historical aspect of it and turning it into something kind of new that harkens back to plantation age. That's fantastic. So um, can you talk a little bit about um, the retail operation that you have there? So we talked a little bit about the tours, but what are people going to see on the tours and do they have a chance to buy some? Sure. Uh, right when you walk into the building, you start your tour with a fresh glass, fresh squeezed sugarcane juice. And this is to begin, and you'll see it get juiced right there in front of you. This is to begin to change the visitor's mindset away from the, you know, whatever they were doing before, <laughs> and you're now entering basically the world of, of sugarcane. Um, and from there, uh, you'll start a tour on our aquaponic deck and begin to look, because our neighboring farm is a big aquaponics farm, a little bit about farming in Cunea in general. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a nice platform that's 12 feet above Cunea, <laughs> so you can see uh, really wide. And for those that don't know where Cunea is, we're smack in the middle of the island, basically, mm -hmm. right in between the two, the east and the western mountain ranges. So it's a nice breadbasket to look at mm -hmm. and beautiful views all the way down to Diamond Head and Pearl Harbor uh, with both mountain ranges to your left and right. Um, but from there, after you learn a little bit about aquaponic farming, we'll move you into the sugarcane garden. And there you'll begin to learn about all the varieties that we have, the legends of each one, and can actually compare and contrast right there mm -hmm. how they look, how they look differently, how they behave differently, um, and where they fit into society, or at least from a thousand years ago. Uh, from there you'll move into, we have very large windows at the distillery, uh, sitting just outside of where our still is located, and be able to actually see the process kind of going forward uh, in terms of rum getting made uh, and everything getting made, quickly shoveled off into this, this tasting room, which I think is really nice and beautiful, uh, so that you can try all the rums that we have in front of you. And that's really the tour. But also there, there's local gelato, Kohana rum gelato, yeah. that's specially made for us in town. We have chocolate bars, because we do make a chocolate honey rum liqueur mm -hmm. using local chocolate and local honey. And then that local chocolate gets converted into a rum-soaked chocolate bar. Or <laughs> we have, this is local honey, used in that rum, uh, chocolate rum uh, liqueur, and then we'll barrel age this honey in one of the barrels after we bottle uh, one of the aged rums. And so we're trying to constantly marry ourselves to other farmers' local Hawaiian agriculture, and then value add it or process it in something that tastes good that people want to really consume. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining yeah, us yeah. today, Jason. Um, so that concludes our show today. I wish we could keep you on longer <laughs> and we could learn more about Kohana Rum and Mauna Lele Distillers, but I'd like to thank you again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We were just joined by Jason Brand, the co-owner of Manu Lele Distillers, who make the famous Hawaiian agricole rum called Kohana with a variety of different types, from clear to brown. They also have a ton of diversified options at their farm, including tours, retail operation, sugar, heirloom sugarcane production, as well as tastings of their local rum that they make. So again, we had Jason Brand of Manu Lele Distillers. This is ThinkTech Hawaii, Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. Ahui ho!